Well, the goal today is to finish 2 Samuel, which will get us basically done with uh, David's story. Uh, so, last time we left off with uh, the, the death of Saul and John, the very end of 1 Samuel. Right? Uh, David had been forced to flee from Saul a couple of times because Saul was trying to kill him. Uh, was was jealous or, or paranoid about David taking the throne, and so he tries to kill David, uh, and so David runs. And twice David proves that he's not trying to kill Saul by not killing Saul when he had the chance. Uh, but after the second time, David is convinced that if Saul gets the opportunity, eventually he's going to have one of these spells and he's going to kill David. And so David stays away from him. He actually hides out in the Philistines. And then later the Philistines attack Israel, and the Philistines end up killing both Saul and his son Jonathan in that battle. And first Samuel, or Second Samuel, actually, remember First Samuel, First Samuel and Second Samuel are one continuous story. It's one book that was split into two because of length of scrolls. And so chapter one, Second Samuel, is immediately following the battle that kills Saul and Jonathan, and David's reaction is probably not exactly what you expect in, in chapter 1 of 2 Samuel. Uh, I mean, David and Jonathan were very close friends, loved each other dearly. You would expect him to be kind of grieved at Jonathan's death. But David expresses grief not only for Jonathan, but also for Saul, because Saul was God's anointed king. He was the one that God chose to lead Israel. And so David sees Saul being killed as, a, as another tragedy, even though Saul was trying to kill him. And so we see this kind of uh, tendency in David to, at least at this point in his life, to, to grieve and mourn even when his enemies die. Uh, when, it's, when it's somebody that is, you know, anointed or, or somehow that is, you know, if, if they are uh, important somehow in God's scheme in, in David's eyes, then their death is significant to David. And David grieves it even if they're his enemies. And so David grieves over Saul's death and, and his friend Jonathan's death. And then David begins, at least, to, to take command or to become, to become king. And at first, there is division in Israel. Because even though Jonathan is Saul's oldest son, and he has just died, Saul has another son. Uh, the other son's name is Ishbosheth. And it, I don't expect you to remember this for the test, but it, the, the son of son's name is Ishbosheth, and he is uh, a lot of a lot of people rally around Ishbosheth and try to make him king because he's the the next in line after after Jonathan, and so they they want the successor of Saul to, to remain king. But David is from the tribe of Judah, and the tribe of Judah is is the largest tribe at this point, and so he becomes. Uh, the king over Judah, the people of Judah make him king. And so then lots, lots of others rally to him, and we end up with a, a civil war, basically. It's a succession crisis. And there is dispute over who the next king should be, and the two sides end up fighting it out, uh, which is extremely, com uh, uh, extremely common in monarchies, especially when there's any kind of doubt over who the next king should be. And so there's, there's these two groups, the, Two parties. There's the, the people that are loyal to the household of Saul and, and want Ishbosheth to be king, and then those that are, are loyal to David and are trying to make David king. And there's there's a series of fights and battles between them, uh, between both sides. But the, the real decisive uh, victory comes when uh, first the the commander of Saul's armies defects and goes over to David because of something that Ishbosheth does to him. Uh, he, he defects from, from Ishbosheth's side and goes over to David's side and carries a lot of the army of Saul with him. And then shortly after that, two men that are loyal to David disguise themselves and sneak into Ishbosheth's home and assassinate him while he's in his bed asleep. And when David, actually when David hears that Ishbosheth has been assassinated, he has the two men that killed Ishbosheth executed. Because he is uh, aggrieved and incensed that first that Ishbosheth has been killed, and second that a man was in in Israel was killed in his own bed, was assassinated in his own home. That that was that was just evil and wrong. I think David always he kind of realized that eventually it was probably going to come down to a battle and Ishbosheth was going to have to die, but he expected it to be Ishbosheth 
on the battlefield and, and ready and fighting for it. And the, the idea that two of his supporters went in and killed this man in his own bed asleep uh, was just wrong to David. And so David mourns the death of Ishbosheth and, and executes his assassins, even though it clears the way for David to become king. And so David does become king over the whole whole nation. And so all of the, the, the nation ends up following uh, King David. And uh, David goes and fights several other kind of significant battles. And among them, among the, the most significant battles that he fights is Jerusalem. He goes and attacks the city of Jerusalem, which is at this point held by uh, Philistines. And so he goes and and fights against uh, or the Jebusites, actually, which is a related tribe, not the Philistines. Uh, so Jerusalem is held by the Jebusites, and David goes and attacks the city and takes it, takes control of the city. And so now, for the first time, Jerusalem is in the hands of the Israelites, uh, <coughs> fully controlled by the Israelites. And so David chooses Jerusalem and makes it his capital city, and it becomes the administrative and political and economic center of Israel. And then shortly thereafter, David plans to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and make Jerusalem the religious center of Israel as well. And so he, he defeats, there's, there's a couple of other battles, he defeats the Philistines, and we start to see uh, more and more the, the nation of Israel is being brought together and unified under David, and they're getting more and more security from their aggressive neighbors, and uh, they're getting more and more prosperity and security because of David's conquest, because of his fighting prowess and ability to lead men. And so David conquers Jerusalem, makes it his capital city, and then he gives the city this, this second name, Zion. And you'll see that name Zion frequently throughout the rest of the Old Testament, particularly in the Psalms and in several of the prophets. Uh, they'll refer to Jerusalem as Zion, especially when they're talking about Jerusalem in an, a particularly uh, religious context, spiritual context, and using it, often the term Zion will be used as this kind of uh, metaphor or euphemism for all of the religious life that was centered in Jerusalem. And so it's the, the place where God's presence dwells and where, where God rules the earth from. Uh, but the, the city, Jerusalem, is nicknamed Zion, and frequently we refer that way through the rest of the, uh, the Old Testament. And then in chapter 6, he brings the Ark of the Covenant to the city, and there is a, a big procession and a, a whole bunch of sacrifices that are made as part of the procession, and David goes in front of them, and there's music playing, and David and, and a bunch of people are dancing at the front of the, the procession, and they bring the Ark of the Covenant into the city. Um, and... You know, it's it's a, a great celebratory day. Uh, now, there has been some some stuff that has happened as, since David got married the first time, right? There's he, he's married to uh, Saul's daughter Michael that that really likes really really loves David. Well, shortly thereafter, David has to go on the run from Saul, and then he keeps having to go on the run from Saul until eventually he's just gone and is gone for years. And in that time, Saul gives Michael to somebody else as a wife. And so Michael ends up marrying somebody else. And then after Saul's death, when David comes back in and, and when people are defecting from Saul's side to come over to David's side after the death of Saul, one of the things that David asks for that he he makes happen is for Michael to be brought back to him as his wife because you know he married her back in the day and, and he, he was married to her and she was his wife first but in that time again she had been given to somebody else and she married somebody else and this other guy apparently also really loved her and so there's there's a scene where where Michael is, is taken and, and to be brought back to David and this other husband is following along, weeping and wailing and mourning that his wife is being taken from him, trying to get her back, and until eventually it's it, he he can't follow anymore and, and has to go back home. And so a, a lot of stuff has happened from from wedding day with Michael to now, and things apparently have, have kind of soured in their relationship. And when David comes back in at the head of this procession, leading the Ark of the Covenant, he's dancing and, and you know, 
celebrating. Michael looks out from an upper window uh, from a balcony and sees David doing all of this dancing and, and floundering around out there. Apparently he danced something like I do or, or something. I don't know. It was, it was fairly embarrassing looking. And so the Michael sees him dancing this way and publicly ridicules him and, and says, oh my, look how dignified the king looks. Uh, dancing like this in front of all of these, these servant women. And so there's, there's conflict here. But the Ark of the Covenant is brought in and the tabernacle is brought into Jerusalem and set up and Jerusalem becomes the religious center as well as the political and economic center of, Jerusalem, of Israel. And then in chapter 7, David has, he has captured Jerusalem, he's made it his capital, he's built it up and fortified it, and he's built a grand palace in the city to serve as not only his home but the administrative center for the, the government. And after all of this is done and he's settled in, and there's some time, there's, there's been some peace. It suddenly hits David that here he is sitting in this nice, well-furnished house, in this, this beautiful palace, and the Ark of the Covenant is still being held in a tent. That, you know, this, this, this symbol of God's presence among them is still dwelling in a tent while David, the king, is, is in this beautiful, well-constructed home. And that doesn't seem right to David. He thinks that they ought to show the Ark of the Covenant at least you know, more honored than the, the king because it's, you know, the nation belongs to God. God is leading the nation. The king is his servant. And so he says, you know, I, I want to build God a house. I, I want to build a house for the, a permanent place for the Ark of the Covenant to be. I want to build a temple. And so he begins to, he explains his plan to Nathan, who is kind of the successor of Samuel. After Samuel dies, Nathan takes over. And so he's a, the kind of he's the prophet or the seer that in, uh, advises the king on what God wants him to do or what he needs to do in, in God's sight. And so when David explains his plan to Nathan, Nathan has this kind of knee-jerk reaction and says, "Yes, go for it. That would delight God. You know, that that would be a fantastic thing for the king to do. So yeah, do do what you plan." But then Nathan leaves, and God kind of breaks in on him and, and tells him, go back to David and tell him, no, I don't want him to build me a house. Uh, that I, I have dwelled in you know, my, my presence. The, this, this tabernacle has, has held the Ark of the Covenant, this temporary shelter, for all these years, and I've never asked for anything else. So, and, and no, David doesn't need to build me a house. Uh, also, God mentions here that he doesn't want David to build the house because of all of the bloodshed associated with David. And even though all of the, the killing and all of the fighting that David has done has been to secure Israel and has largely been at God's direction, God doesn't want the, this man of violence, the, the one that, that has been associated with so much violence, to be the one to build the temple. And so God tells Nathan to go back to, to, to David and to tell him this, that instead of David building a house for God, God is going to build a house for David. Now, David already has a palace, right? So what is he talking about? Well, the, what is intended here, what's meant, is that God is going to establish David's house in, in terms of a lineage or a dynasty. That David and his successors will be the rulers of, of Israel. And so God is, going, God is going to make a covenant or a promise with David that he will establish David's line and, and will make a house for David. And so David's children, and David's son, and successors... For, for then on will be the, the kings who sit on the throne in Jerusalem. And not only does he make that promise, but he promises that one of David's successors will build the temple that David once built. And not only that, but also one of David's successors, a descendant of David, will be the one who fulfills, through whom God fulfills the promises made to Abraham, to his forefathers, that all nations on earth would be blessed through him. And so that, that promise, that covenant that God makes with Abraham way back in, in Genesis chapter 14, now God says, I'm going to fulfill that promise here in 2 Samuel 7. God says, I will fulfill that promise through your descendants. And someone from your family line will sit on the throne of the kingdom that fulfills that promise forever. And someone will sit on the, on, someone from your line will sit on that throne forever. And so the, uh, the immediate fulfillment of this promise is that David's son Solomon builds the temple. Solomon is the one that builds the permanent structure that replaces the tabernacle. And it's built to the same kind of specifications as, 
as the tabernacle, same basic structures and stuff is in it, uh, but it's, it's just on a, a much grander scale, and it's a, a permanent building. And Solomon, David's son, is the one that builds that temple. And so that's the partial fulfillment. And in the Christian understanding, the, the Christian uh, interpretation, is that that promise is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. That Jesus is a descendant of David. That you, can, you can trace Jesus' family line. In fact, two of the Gospels, uh, Matthew and Luke, have a genealogy at the very beginning, or in Matthew it's at the very beginning, and Luke it's actually in chapter 2, I think. Uh, but there, there's a genealogy in the beginning of both of those Gospels that traces Jesus' family line from David down to Jesus. And so Jesus is a descendant of King David, and through him all peoples on earth are blessed, and he is the one who will sit on the throne of that kingdom forever. And so Jesus is the the perfect or the, the complete fulfillment of this promise made to David. Uh, that all, that this, the promise made to Abraham will be fulfilled through his descendant and someone from his family line will sit on the throne of that kingdom forever. So the second Samuel chapter 7, that, that promise that God makes to David is a kind of pivotal moment in the history of Israel and then in second Samuel, the first, first second Samuel, Samuel uh, suite as well. And so it's a, it's a very pivotal moment, and sometimes it's called the Davidic Covenant, right? because it's the promise that God makes to David that is the much more specific uh, promise, uh, focuses down on the promise that's made to Abraham, to David's family line. And so David's response to that, of course, is intense gratitude. You know, God has promised to, make, uh, to build me this house. Who am I? Who is my family? And so there's this intense gratitude to, uh, to God for making this promise to David. And then, starting chapter 8 through chapter 10, there's a, a series of stories of David's accomplishments and the victories that he wins in battle and the way that that, that shores up and strengthens the, the nation of Israel and provides or, or deepens the security. Uh, in the middle of that suite, though, there is one kind of intervening story. Uh, there's a uh, David before he is uh, finally chased off into the Philistine territory by Saul. Uh, he speaks to his friend Jonathan, and Jonathan recognizes that David is going to be the next king, and is even happy for David that he'll be the next king, even though Jonathan would be the natural assumption for the successor. He's Saul's oldest son, the current king's oldest son, and so naturally Jonathan would be the next to the throne if, if Saul dies. But Jonathan recognizes that David has been anointed to be king, and he is happy for his, his friend, that his friend is the one that's been chosen to be king. But Jonathan does ask David to make a promise that when the time comes, when David becomes king, that he won't try to kill off all of Jonathan and his, Jonathan's descendants in order to make his kingdom secure. That was a relatively common thing. Again, when you have a succession crisis, you have two kind of competing parties for the throne, you, you usually end up with a civil war and the two sides have to fight it out before a final king is, is recognized and is able to unify the country. And the expense and the damage caused by that war can be really detrimental and cause a whole lot of extra death and extra hardship and really destabilize the country long term. And so a lot of monarchies a lot, and a lot of uh, kingdoms, when, especially when the, the, uh, the kingship was being transferred from one family to another, when one dynasty ended and another began, the new dynasty, the new king, would wipe out everybody that was a rival claim to the throne to make sure that there wouldn't be a succession crisis, that nobody in a few years could come back and say, well, I am the son of so-and-so, the former king, and, and I'm the rightful king, and, and draw a whole bunch of people to the side and call another war. And so it was, just, it was a, a very common tactic to make sure that the kingdom, the new kingdom, was more stable than it would be if there were potential rival claimants to the throne out there. And so Jonathan asked David to make this promise not to do that, not to do this thing that's very common in monarchies, and David very quickly agrees. He, he doesn't want Jonathan nor any of his family harmed. He's a best friend. He doesn't, he doesn't want his, him and his family harmed. And so after it turns out, though, that after Saul and Jonathan die in battle and David starts to rise and it becomes obvious that David is going to be king, some of the, there, there's a uh, son of Jonathan named Mephibosheth, and the servants that take care of Mephibosheth are worried that David is not going to keep that promise and will end up killing off all these, these sons of, of Saul. And so they take Mephibosheth and they try to run away, but along the way, in their haste to get away from wherever they are, to, to get away and, 
keep David from killing all these descendants of, of Saul, uh, they drop Mephibosheth down the stairs. And Mephibosheth, it, the, the fall down the stairs damages Mephibosheth and he becomes lame. He, he can't walk anymore, lame in both legs. And he grows up that way. And years later, after David's throne is established, but at this point in the story, after Jerusalem is captured and, and all of the, the things that we have, have talked about David's family up to this point, or all things that he's done, uh, David looks around and asks, you know, is there anybody left from Jonathan's family that I could, I could show kindness to for the sake of my, my friend Jonathan? You know, I, I, I love this friend, and I haven't been able to really do anything for him or his family since his death. Is there anyone that I could show kindness to for his sake? And he's told about this guy, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, who was made lame in an attempt to get away from the, the palace after, after Saul died and after Jonathan died. Uh, and he's, he's still out here, still alive. And so, you know, here's this son of Jonathan. And so David calls for Mephibosheth and has him brought in. And Mephibosheth is terrified, thinking that, you know, the time's finally come and David's going to kill him. But instead, David puts Mephibosheth in the palace, gives him a place to, to live, makes sure that he can always eat at the, the king's table. And so he, he eats at, with the king or in, in the king's dining room every day and gives him land and property so that he, he has something to sustain himself and, and his family on. And so the king takes care of Mephibosheth. There's also a kind of a personal connection for the Cummings family here. This, is, this will let you know something about the Cummings family sense of humor. Um, we have a three-legged cat that we named Mephibosheth, you know, named him after the lame son of Jonathan, and we call him Fib. Yeah, that's, that's how the sense of humor goes in the Cummings house. Also, if you ever threaten or harm this cat, Fib, be prepared for my seven-year-old to claim your head by nightfall. That boy is deeply devoted to this cat. It is, like, his, his best friend in the world. Um, but Mephibosheth, our, our three-legged cat, and also the, the lame son of Jonathan. Uh, but David shows kindness to Jonathan, and this kind of again shows you the character of David, that he, he wanted to show kindness to, to this, uh, the son of his, his friend, even though he'd never met this, this son before, apparently. Uh, and so up to this point, we get through the end of chapter 10, we're ready to start 2 Samuel chapter 11, and so far David has been, so far, I mean, he's become the superstar of the Old Testament. Right? He has remained faithful. He's been extremely humble despite uh, all the, the things that God does for him and around him. I mean, he, he kills Goliath and, and does all, has all these amazing victories in battle. Uh, and yet he still remains humble and he's, he's fairly compassionate. And he, he follows God's commands, does what God tells him to. He is grieved when people die that are, even though they're his enemies, if they're, they're part of God's plan, he's, he's grieved and angry that they've been killed. Uh, he shows kindness to Mephibosheth. Uh, he, he's, he's just kind of a, an all-around superstar. Until 2 Samuel chapter 11. And in 2 Samuel chapter 11, David makes his massive moral failure, his, his massive mistake. Uh, he, he does something that is genuinely horrible. Uh, in chapter 11, and it's, the chapter starts out by telling us that it was spring... And it was the time of year when kings went out to battle. So it was the time of year after the, after the winter when, when if you were going to start a camp, military campaign, this was the time to do it. And instead of going out with his troops to battle, David sent the commander of his armies out and he stayed home. He stayed back in the palace. And so David sends his armies out, but he stays home. And then one day while he's at home or towards the evening, he's up on his roof and he looks out. And he sees out on another roof nearby, he sees this woman, Bathsheba, and she's on her rooftop bathing. And so he sees this woman, either totally unclothed or not very clothed, on her roof, cleaning herself, bathing. And she th he thinks that she is extremely good looking, and so he sends some servants to bring her in and sleeps with her. Turns out, though, that Bathsheba is not, you know, an unmarried woman. She is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uh, one of David's soldiers. And Uriah is in battle. I mean, he's, he's at the front lines with the, the rest of his troops. But David calls in and commits adultery with his wife. And Bathsheba, very shortly thereafter, sends back a message to let David know that she's pregnant. 
And David doesn't want it to become known that he has committed adultery, especially with one of his soldiers while they were on the front lines. Talk about a morale killer, right? That would definitely affect the morale in the army if the king is known to be sleeping with your wives while you're, while you're out. And so in order to prevent this, this scandal, prevent it from being known, David sends a messenger and has Uriah brought back from the battle, presumably to give a report on how things are going. But really what David wants is to have him be there for a couple of days and to go home and spend the night with his wife so that everybody will assume that the baby is his. So that his wife is pregnant by his, his, her husband coming back from, from battle for a couple of days. And so he, he sends and Uriah comes back and, and gives him a report about how things are going at the battle. And David dismisses him and tells him to go home and enjoy a couple of days of rest and he will be sent back to, to the field in a couple of days. And David's plan could have worked if it wasn't for the fact that Uriah was entirely too loyal and good a man, way, you know, went way beyond what David was expecting. And instead, after he's dismissed, instead of going home, Uriah stands guard at David's door in full armor and with his weapon all night long. He won't go back to his wife. And the next morning, when David wakes up, he's told what Uriah did. He calls Uriah in and asks him, you know, why didn't you go home to, to see your wife and spend time with her? And Uriah's response is that it would be wrong for me to go home and enjoy my wife and enjoy peace while my brothers are still fighting for their lives on the front lines. And so I, I couldn't go home. I, I'm still, I, I still have a duty. I can't go home and, and enjoy peace and prosperity and enjoy the comforts of home while my brothers are still fighting. And so I didn't, I didn't go home. And so David tells Uriah to, to wait another day and he'll be sent back to the front lines the next day. And that evening, David calls Uriah in and feasts with him and, and basically tries to get him drunk. You know, maybe if he's drunk, his uh, judgment will be uh, compromised. And instead of, of you know, refusing to go home, he'll go ahead and go home and sleep with his wife. But even though Uriah gets drunk, even drunk, he's still too good a man. And he stands in David's door. I guess probably leans against the threshold, depending on how drunk he was. But it, he stays in David's door and guards all night long and doesn't go home to his wife. And the next morning when David wakes up, he's told what Uriah did. And so he calls in scribes and draws up some orders to be given uh, to the commander of the army. And the orders are that Uriah be placed on the front lines of the battle. And then when the, the battle gets to be really fierce, that everyone else withdraw, retreat, and leave Uriah fighting alone on the front lines against overwhelming odds. And that Uriah basically be, be killed. Let, let Uriah be killed in battle. And he seals up the, the orders and gives them to Uriah to take to his commander back at the front lines. And if you, any of you are, are Shakespeare fans, you might remember in Hamlet there's a similar scene where a couple of guys are disposed of by being given orders to be given to a commander and whatnot. Uh, it's where the idea comes from. What is it? I think it's Hamlet. It's not really relevant. Um, but that Uriah is given orders to take to his commander, and when the commander opens them, they are orders to leave Uriah to die on the front lines. And the commander follows the orders, and sure enough, Uriah is struck down and killed in battle. And word is sent back to David that Uriah the Hittite has been slain, and so he calls for, sends for Bathsheba, takes her into his house, and marries her. And thinks that, you know, what happened has been covered. Now when the, when the child is born, it'll be assumed to be David's from after the wedding. And, you know, everything will be fine. And so David thinks that he has gotten away with it. Until the next chapter. In chapter 12, uh, David is visited by Nathan, our Samuel descendant prophet and seer, advisor to the king. And Nathan's approach here is interesting and probably very wise. Instead of coming in and directly confronting David for having done what he did, uh, he comes in and tells David a story. And he tells David that uh, this is he tells David this is a story about something that has happened in his kingdom, uh, a case that has, has cropped up in his kingdom, and David needs to decide what to do about it. He says that there is there is a man, a relatively poor man, that had. Uh, 
bought a lamb very shortly after its birth, and he and his family raised that lamb, cared for it like it was one of their children, you know, held it in their arms, uh, and they, they really dearly loved this lamb and, and were raising it. And their next door neighbor, the, the next man down the lane, their neighbor had a huge flock of sheep, a hundred sheep. Uh, but one night this, this neighbor has a guest that comes and instead of going and taking one of his own sheep from his own flock and slaughtering it to provide a feast for this, for this guest that came, this neighbor went over and stole the man's one sheep that he, he and his family loved and slaughtered it and fed it to his guest so that he wouldn't have to touch his own flock. And he says, you know, this, this is what happened. What should happen to him? You know, what is the king's decision? And David hears this and that this, this has happened inside, his, inside of Israel. That this has been done in Israel. And he is incensed, just, just ticked off at the idea that somebody would go and steal this little lamb that this family loves so much to keep from having to kill one of their many to feed their own guest. And he says, that man, bring him, bring him here and we'll kill him. That, that man must die for doing such a thing in Israel. And then Nathan points back at David, puts his finger in his face and says, you are the man. You are that man. You had many wives already. You have all the nation of Israel. You, you have all the wealth. And you saw one woman, dearly loved by her husband, that you wanted. And you took her and you had him killed to hide it. You are that man. And then Nathan goes on it, on to tell David the consequences uh, of his of his actions. This is uh, in chapter twelve, uh, starting verse seven. Then Nathan said to David, "You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says: I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you, and your master's wives into your arms." I gave you all Israel and Judah, and if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why then did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what was evil in his sight? You struck down your eye the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of your eye of the Hittite to be your own. And the, the consequences go on to be described. It's basically, David's family is always going to face catastrophe, that the, the sword will never depart. There will always be violence and contention in David's household. And David, to his credit, his immediate reaction is to repent, to, to apologize. He, he recognizes that he failed, that he messed up, and he repents. And if you, you want to see a record of that, you want to see a fuller uh, account of David's repentance, uh, look in Psalm 51. Uh, psalm 51 is known as a as the the great psalm of repentance and if you look at the the introductory note to uh, to psalm 51 it says of david after nathan the prophet confronted him uh, regarding the wife of uriah the type and so all of psalm 51 is david's prayer or song of repentance to god after after his massive failure here and so after after he after he repents and, and recognizes his fault, Nathan says, your sin has been taken away, you're, you're forgiven, but there's still consequences. The, these things that God has promised, they're still going to happen. There are still consequences to your actions. And from this point on, David's family and David's kingdom just kind of falls apart. Uh, first, there is uh, David has you know, several children by several different, uh, different wives at this point. He's actually got three wives. Uh, plus, apparently, uh, some, some wives of, of Saul, after Saul died. Uh, and so David has several children, and two of them are Amnon and Tamar. And they're, they have different mothers, but they're, they both are uh, David's children. Amnon and, uh, is the son of one woman, and Tamar is the daughter of another. And Tamar is described as being extremely beautiful, and Amnon gets a crush on her and falls head over heels for her. And he's, he pines for her and is, you know, all, all this stuff. And eventually he works out this plan where he's going to pretend to be sick and ask David, ask his father, to send Tamar to come and take care of him while he's sick. And so he does it, and David, not suspecting anything, sends Tamar to go in and take care of her brother while he's sick. And so while, while Tamar is taking care of Amnon while he's sick, uh, 
Amnon arranges for all the servants, everybody else to be out of the house, and then he drags Tamar to bed and rapes her. And think of it, I mean, that, that is horrible in itself, but then immediately after he rapes her, his feelings toward her change, and now he despises her, can't stand the sight of her. And so he drives her out, sends her away. And that even, that makes the situation even worse because now Tamar has not only been raped, but now she's going to be exposed to this public disgrace. And it, it, this, is, this is the worst possible thing that he could do to her. And so he, he drives Tamar away. And Tamar has a, a full brother, another son of, of David named Absalom. And when Absalom hears what Amnon did to his sister, he is enraged. And he quickly orchestrates Amnon's death, orchestrates his assassination, and has had Amnon killed. Well, when David hears that another of his sons has been killed, that another of his sons has died, he exiles Ab Absalom and won't let him remain in Jerusalem and tells him that he can never come into the king's presence again, never, never be in the palace and never see David again. Well, Absalom, it turns out, is a pretty good-looking guy and is pretty savvy, and so he starts to work things and puts pressure on David through various other people to end his exile and let him come back to Jerusalem, and then eventually to even end the prohibition against him coming to the, the palace and seeing David. And while he's doing all this, over the time that he's in exile and then back in Jerusalem, and then when he gets to come to the palace, he starts schmoozing people and drawing people over to his side, and he starts kind of orchestrating this coup until he has a large enough force that's behind him, a large enough number of supporters behind him that he's able to take the city. And David suddenly wakes up one day to, to being told that his son Absalom has declared himself king and is on his way to the city. And if David doesn't run right now, he doesn't have enough forces in the city to stop Absalom and he and his family will be killed. And so David flees with his immediate family and the, the his, his own private guards that are still loyal to him and a few others and flees out of Jerusalem. And along the way, he is cursed at and betrayed and, and abandoned by people that he thought that were loyal to him until uh, eventually as, as he flees, he, he does find some that are loyal and, and picks up a pretty decent army around him, people that are still loyal to him. But Absalom also has this huge army and he has come into Jerusalem and has taken the city. And David is, again on the run from a, a king that's trying to kill him and forced to hide in caves to stay alive. Well, Absalom is given some advice by some supporters of David that doesn't work out to his best interest. And so eventually, when Absalom it gives David time to consolidate and to get his forces together, and by the time Absalom pursues him, sends an army after David, David has a pretty good army to oppose him, and the two armies clash. And the, the commanders of David's army told him that he can't be anywhere near the battle, and if, if, if anything happens to him, then all of this will be for nothing, so he has to stay back. But Absalom comes to the battle with his troops. And David, when he sends off his commander, sends off the army to go and confront Absalom's army, he tells them, you know, make sure that if, if at all possible, you, you protect Absalom, because I don't want to lose another son. Even though he's betrayed me, even though he's done all this, I don't want to lose another son. And so the, the commander of the army agrees, but then in the battle, Absalom is disabled. He's, he's in a situation where he can't fight, and instead of sparing him like David asked, the commander of his armies kills him to keep David from ever having to deal with another rebellion from this, this kid. Actually, the way the story goes, Absalom apparently had, he, he, was, he was apparently a good-looking guy, and he had some really impressive man hair, uh, big, big, long, flowing locks. And he goes riding away from the battle, and he, he rides under a tree, and the branches of the tree hang down low enough to get caught up in his, his, his hair, and he gets pulled off the, the saddle of his horse and hangs from the tree until the, the commander of David's army finds him with a bunch of his men, and they surround him and stab him with spears until he dies while he's hanging there helpless from the tree. And when the word is brought back to David that Absalom has been killed, he is just shattered, heartbroken. And the, the scene, the description uh, of David's reaction or his response is it's at the end of chapter 17, and, or end of chapter 18, and 
the, the scene is just David just weeping, saying, my son, my son, oh, Absalom, my son, it, it, if, if only I could take your place in, among the dead and uh, you be alive, oh, oh, my son, my son, Absalom, oh, my son. And just this heartbreaking, heart-wrenching scene of, of David mourning the death of his son that had just betrayed him and tried to have him killed to take over the throne. So Absalom's rebellion is defeated and David returns as king, but he returns a very different man. I mean, all, all of the things that have happened since his uh, sin with Bathsheba has, has changed him, broken him. And he is not as confident and swaggering and, and sure of himself when he pronounces judgment anymore. And so he, there are lots of people that rebelled against him uh, along with Absalom that he, he doesn't deal with. He just says let them live, you know, doesn't deal with them. Uh, and there are several people in the, the next couple chapters, chapter 19 and 20, that uh, rebel against David. Uh, there are several rebellions against him that he has to deal with and put down because he's just, he's not the same as he was. Uh, he's not the same king that he was before, that everybody wanted to follow and that nobody wanted to rebel against. And so he's, he's changed by all this. And that's kind of the end of the story of David's reign in 2 Samuel. Uh, the last several chapters of 2 Samuel, so 20, 21 through 24, uh, is an intentionally kind of set apart conclusion to the whole sweep of 1 and 2 Samuel. And so up until this point, we've had a more or less chronological account of things that, that happened. But then in chapters 21 through 24, we get a, a grouping of stories that are outside of the chronology of the rest of the book. Uh, and they're set up in a way, a specific way, to, uh, to serve as a kind of conclusion to this whole story. And it is a chiastic structure, chiasmus. We talked about chiasmus in, with Leviticus. Uh, chapters 21 through 24 of 2 Samuel form another chiasmus or chiastic structure with stories that mirror each other in a kind of you know, reverse, reverse order fashion. So the, the first story in chapter 24 and the last story in chapter, or first story in 21 and the last story in 24 have a very similar theme. In both cases, it is the king making decisions and doing things that end up with the whole nation suffering. The, that king makes a bad decision and the whole nation suffers. In the first story in, in chapter 21, it's Saul, and the second story in chapter 24, it's David. And then inside of those two stories, after the, the story of Saul's uh, mistake and then before the story of David's mistake that caused suffering, there are two scenes that, that talk about David and going into battle. And the first one uh, shows David going into battle and at, at one point he's going up against somebody and that person that is a Philistine and they're able to knock him down and they're about to kill him. And so David, after being victorious over the giant Goliath, is now about to be killed to a much lesser champion of, uh, of the Philistines until one of his own retainers, one of his most loyal men, steps in at the last minute and saves his life. And then from that point on, David is, they, they tell David, his, his guard tells him, you, you can't be in the thick of battle anymore. Uh, we can't lose the king. So you, you can't be in the thick of battle anymore. And then at the end, we have this listing of all of the great heroes in David's reign, the, the, the great fighting men, and, and David's most loyal men, the ones that fought with him. And again, David isn't in the list, and he's not allowed into those battles. Um, and there's another detail there that we'll come back to in just a second that adds a little extra detail to what happened in chapter 11. And then in the centermost two sections are two poems that uh, kind of summarize a lot of the action and, and the themes of First and Second Samuel, especially God's provision and grace to David and his family, to, that even though David has messed up in a big way, God has remained faithful to him and to his family and to Israel. Uh, and it highlights the... Uh, God's tendency to exalt the humble and to bring down the proud that we saw from Hannah's song in, in the beginning of the book, uh, beginning of 1 Samuel. Uh, and there's, there's just a lot of echoing of those themes, and we get, we get brought forward as this, in this kind of encapsulation, the climax of this encapsulating summary at the end of 2 Samuel, these major themes of God exalting the humble and bringing down the proud and God's faithfulness and grace and that God will keep this Davidic covenant made to David in, in chapter 7. And that someday, you know, God will bring a ruler that will, through whom all, all people on the earth will be blessed. This Davidic king will come. 
Uh, one final thing that I want to I want to show you that you know, if you did the readings for today, you you've probably already seen, uh, but you may it may not have struck you the significance may not have hit you. Uh, this is in chapter 23, the very last verse. Uh, all of chapter 23 is this uh, accounting of the the most loyal warriors to David, David's most warrior, most loyal fighters, and there's a described this group of three that were these just great warriors, fantastic warriors, and then another that was almost as good, but wasn't accounted with the three, um, but became the captain of David's personal guard, his, his bodyguard. And then there's a list of 37 uh, that are all extremely well-known, well-regarded fighters. They were all great champions and all very loyal to David and had, had followed him, been with him for years, and these 30 were, were kind of behind the, the three greatest as, as being some of the most uh, capable fighters and best champions, most loyal people to David in Israel. And if you look at the very last verse in chapter 23, the, the very last name in this list of the most loyal and, and best fighters in Israel, the most, David's most loyal men, it says, and Uriah the Hittite, there were 37 in all. And so this, this guy, Uriah, he's not just a random dude. He's not just a soldier, not just somebody that happened to have a wife that David thought was attractive. This is one of David's most loyal supporters that followed him through all of the troubles with Saul, with, with all the times that he had to flee, that protected David, and stuck with him when, when he was on the run. And that helped him fight through all of the various battles and protected him every time that he went into battle against all of the various forces that he, he was against in, in his reign helped him secure his kingdom. Uriah was one of his closest and most loyal supporters, one of the top 37 men in the kingdom as far as David was concerned. And that's who David kills to have his adultery covered up. His wife he steals, and who, has he, who he has killed to, to have his, his sin covered up. So that just kind of gives you some extra detail, some extra oomph as to how bad what David did was. Uh, we are out of time. We didn't get out of there like I was hoping, but that, that's it. Uh